Hello, BookTube. It's New World's November. Well, you'd hardly know it from my channel. <laughs> I've been an absentee parent for New World's November, where I am one of the co-hosts. It's an event that was created by the Bookish Bryants, uh, designed to celebrate science fiction. All things science fiction, but uh, this year, as last year, we are concentrating on shorter form stuff, short novels or short stories and novellas. Uh, but all kinds of science fiction is being celebrated, and what would a science fiction event be without lists? <laughs> science fiction thrives on lists. And also, when you think about it, what would a science fiction event be without woolly old science fiction brontosauruses butting heads together <laughs> or agreeing with each other? <laughs> and, and, and along those lines, Sean D. Stanfast, who's another one of the hosts of this event, recently did a video about his favorite science fiction series, Top Ten, in order. And it was fascinating. Videos like that are always fascinating. He nominated several candidates that made me roll my eyes in any list where you where you're watching something like this especially something as an opinionated a genre as science fiction you're going to see things on someone else's list and say not only would i not put that on my list but what on earth is that doing on any list <laughs> what you are nominating junk sir <laughs> and others other entries on the list you're going to be nodding enthusiastically it was exactly that way for me with sean's list he started off with the Skylark series by E.E. E. Doc Smith, a pure Shanti Standfast pick, and he followed it up with the Lensman series. These these things, he called them space opera, which is a kind of bagatelle term in science fiction for things that concentrate more on shoot 'em ups and all the planets are the same, and uh, no, no, it's it's mainly genre western adventure stories mapped onto ray guns and faster than light travel and it can be done well or not as you're going to see in my own list e. e doc smith never wrote a word of prose in his life that was worth reading <laughs> and here there are two examples on this list from john but he also recommends uh, another one on his list is the barsoom novels of edgar rice burroughs about John Carter of Mars, who goes, John Carter, who's from Earth, but is transported to the, the planet Mars, a fantasy version of the planet Mars, where his Earth-bred muscles give him superpowers, and there are all sorts of adventures, and of course, I want to strongly recommend the Barsoom novels, I want to strongly second that, although, does it belong on this list? Does it belong on a list? Is it actually a series? I mean, it, it's a shared universe, certainly, but uh, do you need to read uh, John Carter of Mars, or, or, or A Princess of Mars, or Gods of Mars, or Swords of Mars? Do you need to read that to read Lana of Gothel? I, I don't know, but I understand the, the gist of it. Same thing with the next one. Uh, Sean recommends The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy uh, by Douglas Adams, and of course... I want to second that recommendation. He also recommends Riverworld, the Riverworld books by Philippe Jose Farmer. He has a soft spot for them. I don't quite know why. They're not, they're not really good. <laughs> they're, but again, you know, on a, on a technical level, I suppose the Barsoom novels aren't really good either. So <laughs> they certainly, they certainly are enjoyable. I'll leave a link to Sean's video down below so you can argue with him yourself. Then he lists uh, books that I guess one of the, the sticking points here is that uh, very few of the books on his list I don't think were ever originally conceived as the first part in a series. I think the authors just ran with it. But maybe that's a naive quibble, because oftentimes in science fiction, and certainly in the murder mystery, when an author strikes a chord with their readers, they will run with it. It will suddenly become a series. He mentions the Giants books by James Hogan, uh, The Gentle Giants of Ganymede and all, and all the rest. And... Uh, I myself don't believe that the Giants books were any more conceived as a series than almost anything else on his list, but they are really good. It, it significantly intellectually meatier than anything else on his book on his list except two. <laughs> uh, then he also mentions, well, this is Sean T. Stanfast, right? So of course he's going to mention Isaac Asimov. And he mentions, I, Asimov is on his list not once, but twice. One for the robots books. Good Lord. <laughs> Talk about it improvisational things and then of course the foundation books which sprawl ever onward and yeah, <laughs> they're they're quite good 
the, the first three books are quite good, but... Mm. Well, I imagine the Foundation books would be on pretty much everybody's list if they made a list like this of science fiction series. Probably if I had made the original list, I am in this video, in case you didn't gather, I'm doing a response video, so I'm not going to just retread the ground that Sean covers, uh, but probably the Foundation books at least would be on everybody's list. And certainly... Uh, his next pick, Dune, by Frank Herbert, would be on everybody's list. The the original five Dune novels of Frank Herbert. Uh, Sean says that he's never read any of the endless, endless books by Herbert's son. And I wonder what he would make of it. I really do. That made me want to to uh, send him an ebook copy of House of Trades or something, some abomination like that, and see what he makes of them. Uh, but life is short. He might not want to invest the time. And then he finishes his list with number one, his favorite thing, his favorite science fiction series, which is the Hyperion Cantos of Dan Simmons. I wholeheartedly recommend. I wholeheartedly second that recommendation. They are absolutely incredible. Uh, but when I watched his video, I automatically started thinking of other series, of series that aren't on the list. Sean, his list is fantastic, and it's fun to, to poke around with it, to poke fun at it, but uh, it stops. You know, the exception of the Hyperion Cantos, it stops a fairly long time ago. Uh, so maybe, may, I was thinking maybe a few more recent series, or older ones that Sean didn't mention. Maybe he likes them too. Uh, so, and then when I left a comment on his video saying that I loved it, and he said, now it's time for your own list, and I thought, all right, well, if the door is open, I'll make a list of my own. So I myself have made a list of 10 other science fiction series, which will not only respond to Sean Stanfast's video, but also form a kind of meager, cringing contribution on my part to an event that I'm helping to host. <laughs> so we'll start with number 10, The Majapur Chronicles by Robert Silverberg. These are loosely grouped stories set around an enormous world uh, that is and always has been a kind of ragged spaceport. So it's not really, you, you don't get much of a science fiction feeling off these stories, but it is a science fiction series. Aliens find this world. Alien artifacts find their way into, into Majapur, even though Majapur itself is sort of a quasi-Renaissance at most, technology and social level. And they are quite good. The Majapur Chronicles, they get they are quite good. One of the problems you have with science fiction in series is that they start to become very derivative. They, they start to become very fan servicey and lose any kind of, of ideological momentum. We're going to see that a lot on this list. We'll start, might as well. The Majapur Chronicles don't do that because Robert Silverberg is a, a powerhouse author. But even powerhouse authors can start to merely check boxes. Especially if your series starts to lock in an audience. If it locks in an audience, then the writer has much less work to do. And what writer have you ever met that doesn't want to do much less work? <laughs> Provided they get paid the same meager slave wages. Uh, so this next one is the Safehold novels of David Weber. Oh, I have got Off Armageddon Reef here, which is the first one. But these, this is an, uh, a long, long series of novels that, much like the Majapur Chronicles, uh, has a, a kind of a, a yeasty layer of science fiction on it, but quite a bit is grown off that layer that is not science fiction. Don't let the cover fool you. The premise of this whole thing, the whole run of these safe old books, is that humans in the far distant future are attacked by an alien species that is far more powerful than they are and that's attracted to high levels of technology. Think about one of the solutions to the Fermi paradox. One of the solutions to the Fermi paradox is one of the great filters of the Fermi paradox is that once your technology reaches a certain Kardashev level, you become known to all other advanced species and they wipe you out. <laughs> this is sort of the same thing. There's an alien species that wipes out humans except for a fugitive band that go to a planet and in order to protect themselves from detection by this alien species, they intentionally create a pre-industrial, non-technological society. They include an immortal android with all of the, kind of a backdoor, all of the technological specs, a safety valve, 
but the, the Android himself is not itself is not detectable, and the world is not. So what we get for novel after novel after novel is basically late medieval religious and social maneuvering, historical novels under the guise of science fiction novels with si a few science fiction novels mixed in. That is that too is going to crop up on my list a lot. These are quite good in terms of their median, the median intelligence and and you know heft of of each volume. Quite good. Um, I could, this list could be so much longer. I whittled down to just some re the ones that really stuck out to me. Like, for instance, The Dragon Riders of Pern by Anne McCaffrey. You see on this cover a young woman riding a dragon, and you think, oh, come on, that, that's fantasy. That's not science fiction. But nope. Uh, the Pern books are very adroit science fiction. They are science fiction metamorphosed into fantasy. Where the Earth colonists, human colonists, reach the planet Pern in the Rookbat sector, and it looks just fine. It has ample oceans, plenty of indigenous life, uh, infinitely arable land. It looks like a perfect place to set down a human colony. But what the original human inhabitants don't really realize is that one of the other planets in the system sometimes comes close enough to Pern so that organisms called thread can make the passing from one world to another and enter the atmosphere of Pern. And they are corrosive to everything organic that they touch. They kill people, of course, during Threadfall. If you're out in Threadfall, you will die horribly, but also crops. And the, all of the life forms on Pern have been adapted with thread in mind. And the, the desperate colonists genetically engineer some of those life forms into gigantic dragons that can not only teleport from place to place and so teleport out of harm's way of, of thread, but also that can chew kind of chemical reactants and blast phosphine gas that destroys thread in mid-flight. And they become the dragons of Pern. And they are telepathically bonded to their riders who become a kind of elite planetary defense force, but they most of those riders, in fact, those riders just in general, have no memory whatsoever. This is generations later. They have no memory of any technology. They, they are living in a feudal world. I would include here uh, the, dragon, the Dragon Riders of Pern. The Pern novels went on forever and ever and ever. And now I believe Anne McCaffrey's son is continuing them. In terms of the series and, and what I mentioned before about the law of diminishing returns when it comes to series, I would say the first three books, Dragonflight, Dragon Quest, White Dragon, and then Moreta, Dragon Lady of Pern. The first three are a concrete trilogy, but then the story goes on, and Moreta is really good. The fourth book is really good. After that, it's hit or miss. You take your chances. There, some of them are very good. Uh... All the Weirs of Pern, The Girl Who Could Talk to Dragons, but, but others not. <laughs> so it's a long, ongoing series, much like a lot of the things that I'm mentioning here. Then the next one that I'll mention is something that's come up a few times on this channel just recently. And this is the Pliocene Exile series uh, of Julian May. This is the first book, The Many Colored Land. I mentioned this in a couple of recent videos. I don't want to block the bean there since you're getting a perfect view of her snoozing face. Uh... This takes place, This the setting is, once again, there is a there is a, a loamy underlayer of science fiction here. Although here, the science fiction elements run throughout the book. Uh, this starts off in a future world in which humans have joined an enlightened galactic confederacy. And human latent psionic powers have been, have come to the fore, have been greatly enhanced. So the humans have, most humans have an array of superpowers of one kind or another. There are like five or six psionic ability families and you can have some you can have some stronger than others and uh they're all familiar things like telepathy or clairvoyance or telekinesis and that future world is a little sterile some of the humans in it a small handful feel like outcasts for one reason or another and they have uh an alternative in a valley in france a time portal has been discovered that goes one way you go through it and you end up millions of years ago in the Pliocene era with gigantic beasts and prehistoric quasi-humans and, uh, in other words, a rough uh, extreme hiking adventure from which you cannot return. 
And Many Colored Land starts off with a group of those humans who, for one reason or another, some of them tragic, some of them merely peak, decide to make that voyage. And what they don't know, what no one knows, because you can't get a message back, it's a one-way trip, is that on the other end of that, of that time portal, millions of years ago, on the Earth of millions of years ago, two alien races have crash-landed and are enslaving immediately every human who comes through that portal. Um, a clash ensues that takes four books to happen, and they are delightful. Many Colored Land, The Golden Torque, The Non-Born King, and The Adversary. They are, uh, they are really, really good. There are no others that continue that story in the Pliocene for very good reasons. <laughs> That story, the story in the Pliocene, cannot continue after the end of these books. But the 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 uh, world, the future human world, gets many other novels by Julian May, and those are also really good. Uh, but this series will work just fine. Then we have uh, Cage Baker. I I don't want to say whether or not Cage Baker is still alive. I I won't make that guess about any of these authors except the ones I'm sure are dead. Uh, and this is these are the company novels. This is just one in the Garden of Eden, but there are a number of company novels. They're time travel novels that start out with a group called the Company that is using time travel technology to salvage the past from ruin. Picture, in other words using a time travel device to go onto the Titanic in mid-voyage right before it, it strikes an iceberg and sinks in order to save the priceless jewel-encrusted copy of the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, which was on board the ship and is now at the bottom of the, of the North Atlantic. You, the idea being you want to save these things, but you want to save them right before they would have gone destroyed so that you don't harm the timelines. The classic example of this is going back in time and making digital copies of every book in the Library of Alexandria. But Cage Baker weaves a whole bunch of stories. That that basic kind of premise is in these novels extrapolated wildly and wonderfully. These these are wonderfully wonderfully human books. And then talking about wonderfully human, here's a series that if you were to ask most people who weren't Sean Stanfast, <laughs> most people whose reading tastes extend beyond 1961, best science fiction series, I bet most, certainly most young people, most people under the age of 30, would immediately come up with my next choice. It would be the first thing they'd think of. Whether or not they ended up putting it on a best of list, it would be the first thing they think of. And that is the Expanse novels of the author duo going under the name of James Corey. This is the first one, Leviathan Wakes. This goes on, it's concluded now, it goes on for, what, 10 books in the Earth's future. A lot of you will have seen the uh, the great TV series, so you'll know all about some of the basic concepts here. But this is one of the basic concepts that uh, that animates the beginning of the series. As it, go, it goes on from there, it exfoliates in every direction. But one of the basic concepts that animates the this at the beginning is basically first contact. We, we encounter a human world that has expanded out into the solar system, has expanded out to Mars and to the asteroid belt, but it's all human. There's nothing extraterrestrial. And the, the wonder of a lot of, the, the element of wonder running through the early books in the series is that that would be awe-inspiring. It wouldn't just be that the Vulcans show up and say hi. It would, it would be awe-inspiring and probably terrifying if something non- terrestrial made its a contact with humans but this is really just a elaborate space opera that's a term that comes up in sean's video quite a bit and we should have a discussion video about it what i wouldn't give to have a discussion video about that or anything else with any of my co-hosts but space opera i've i've used it myself in this video and it, it's it's a little bit nebulous to pin down it's basically where the trappings of science fiction are not exhaustively determinative. You, you, you have, you know, faster than possible travel, whether it's faster than light or just extremely accelerated travel. You have extraplanetary buildings or settlements. You have tech that's extrapolatable from what we have now, but doesn't yet exist. And it is very much non-determinative. It, it, it is just there. It is the means by which the author tells what is basically a human or an adventure story. And 
space opera hasn't died very much so <laughs> very much has not died crystal rocio any of you know those books the sun eater books pure example of science fiction space opera and so is this uh, and tremendously good and uh refreshingly something that doesn't often happen at least didn't used to happen in the, in the bad old days of science fiction series the expanse novels were brought out in gorgeous paperbacks right from the beginning it was i remember seeing them at the what leviathan wakes and the next one in the series and thinking boy these are lovely they found a great artist who's doing great work and they decided to make them look really really good right from the beginning so they are gorgeous on your shelf uh then we'll uh, we'll go uh something very similar to the expanse in a lot of ways this is the mars trilogy of kim stanley robinson starting off with red mars and this is this is at its heart, again, at its heart, the science under layer underlying the series is the colonization and then terraforming of Mars, which uh, is a fancy word for, for you don't just go there and set up pens in order to walk around in spacesuits. You eventually want to transform Mars into a livable version of a planet, into what it was millions of years ago, into something like what Earth is. And the, the standard thinking is that it would be easier to, tell, to terraform Mars than it would be to terraform Venus. Venus being, in, all, in most other ways, the most likely candidate. It's close. It's an almost exact geophysical double of Earth, whereas Mars is not. Mars is, has a fraction of the gravity, a fraction of the mass, a fraction of the size, a fraction of the electromagnetic field. All of those things are vital to a walking around in shirt sleeves human colony. Venus has all of those things, but unfortunately, Venus's runaway greenhouse gas effect has made it into a hellscape that melts metal, melts metal on the surface. So you can't have that, and it, and fixing that would take a million years. Terraforming terraforming Venus with with any technology that isn't simply snapping your fingers magic would take a million years, and that isn't true with Mars. <laughs> it's probably not true with Mars, but the real wonder of these books any of you've ever read kim stanley robinson will know the real wonder of these books is the human characters this is an, a thoroughly human story these three books red mars blue mars and green mars are a tremendously human story very involving you will you will like the very smart ways that this author info dumps but you'll stick with the series for the humans involved uh then this next one again straddles the line the Magipore chronicles seem to me to straddle the line between science fiction and fantasy a bit explicit stop, 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 stop. explicit science fiction elements are in there but it, the, the bulk of a lot of the stories is is you know not same thing with the safe hold books same thing very much with this next series but i'm going to defend it i'm going to defend my choice this is these are the alvin maker books the tales of alvin maker by orson scott card this is the cover for volume number three prentice alvin and these take place in an alternate colonial era America where a lot of people have knacks, inborn abilities to do certain things, whether it's fire starting or reading the hearts of other people or communicating across distances, or in the case of a pestiferous little Corsican named Napoleon Bonaparte, taking over the volition of people nearby you, <laughs> swaying them to your way of thinking. Uh, and... In the mythology of this world, the greatest knacks of all, the, the people who have the sum total of all knacks, are called makers. And usually a good leg up on being a maker in this world is that you are born the seventh son of a seventh son. And that's what Alvin Maker is, the son of a miller. Not otherwise a remarkable person, but he is, he is a maker. And the reason I'm defending this book, this is basically his growing up. The first three books in the series are basically him growing to a young man, and then the books go on from there. And the reason I'm defending it as science fiction is because the Knacks can't do just anything. They they are very much organized along a principle. I think Orson Scarcard is writing them as science that isn't understood. No different, really, from the, the metaphysical psionic abilities in the, the Pliocene Exile series. And... My foremost proof of this is that when Alvin is learning how to master his abilities as a maker, at one point he looks deep, deep inside something. It's actually the, the item on the cover there, the no-go plow. 
he looks deep inside this thing. And what he's seeing, he doesn't have the words for it. And Orson Scott Card doesn't interrupt the narrative to give you the words. But what he's seeing is clearly its atomic structure. It couldn't be anything else. And that's science. That's science fiction. He's not, he can't do anything that that atomic structure won't allow. He can't, no, no, no one can. They ha the, they, the fantasy in here has to work along explicitly scientific lines. Uh, in, in Alvin's case with, <coughs> with the no-go plow, his goal is to make it sentient uh, by moving things around inside it, not just by incanting magic. So I'm going to include the Prentice Alvin books on here. It's a bit of a stretch. Uh, this next one is, is old. It's out of print. I've recommended it many, many times on this channel. One more time won't hurt. It's a great series. It only went to four volumes. I wish it had gone to ten. This is The Journeys of McGill Fayette by Kevin O'Donnell. This is book one, Caverns, and uh, the young man in the multicolored coat there is McGill Fayan, who is a flinger. These books take place in the, in the nominal future, a little bit in the future, and there's a group of people who, this guy's actually a flinger too, but he's down on his luck. There's a group of people called flingers who can teleport things up to a certain amount of distance and a certain amount of weight. They have that inborn ability. And not many people do. So they live life of princes. They are well paid, well compensated, but their life is pretty is is pretty drudgery. They they sit in their booth, in their flingers booth, and just fling things all day long. It's they don't have to do anything. It's just a mental process. But you can imagine that people would pay through the nose to avoid conventional travel and the expenses of conventional travel in order to have something flung from one place to another. In the first book, Caverns, McGill Fayan has to learn his abilities and also go through the, the rather uh, the rather macabre coming of age ritual of any new flinger. <laughs> they have taken under the every new flinger is taken under the wing of an old flinger whose talent is going away. They're losing control of it. If it, obviously you can see the potential for horrible nightmarish results if you lose control of that ability. And therefore older flingers, once they're done teaching and mentoring their young their young protégés, the, one of the first things they want their young protégé to do is fling them into the sun. Because <laughs> there's no use to anybody anymore. There's no use having this talent and tormenting you to use it if it's not safe to use it. Uh, and then McGill Fane has a number of adventures. These are wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. I wish there were more of them. Uh, and then we'll uh, we'll finish up with, again, a series that I have praised on this channel many, many times. I could praise it forever. Even though it has all of the weaknesses of that I've described often attend science fiction series, including maybe the E.E. E. Doc Smith stuff. Maybe I've come full circle to eating crow. <laughs> but like I said, any list like this is going to have you agreeing and disagreeing in equal measures. But I've mentioned this series many times before. It is called... Uh, variously the change series or the emberverse series it's by sm sterling the first book is dies the fire and it is set in the, uh, the normal world right before the internet became ubiquitous at the beginning of dies the fire in the pacific northwest which is where this takes place no one has a computer no one has a cell phone but there is still technology right it's it takes place in basically the late 1990s and in that world, one day, out of nowhere, that no one can explain, there is a blinding flash in everyone's mind. It's intensely painful, but it's over so fast that mo they don't even have time to experience the pain. The experience of pain is kind of a memory. And when that flash is over, no technology works. No higher technology works. Planes fall out of the sky. Ignitions don't work. Electricity doesn't work. Power plants don't work. Even gunpowder doesn't work. So the world is immediately thrown back into a water wheel and bicycle medieval type experience. Only everyone remembers having more advanced technology. And the bulk of this first book, S.M. Sterling concerns himself with what would actually happen immediately when that happened. We, we, are st we start out with a core cast of characters in this book. We get a lot of what's going on in their lives and then the change happens. That's what it's called, the change with a capital C. Uh, and immediately after that, we get the fallout. What would happen? What would people have to do to survive? 
and would there be good ways and bad ways? One of the fundamental assertions that S.M. Sterling makes right away in this book is that large cities would become death zones. There wouldn't be any way to survive in large cities. Our characters stay well clear of them and, and try to eke out their survival in the woodlands and the wilds of the Pacific Northwest in the Willamette Barry, Valley. And we center on a couple of groups of people, two that are fairly decent people, and one that isn't <laughs> the villain of the piece. His group is not, is not decent. And that's what I mean, that it's come up on this list a few times, of the science fiction sort of forming the basis only, and then the book is something else. This series goes on forever and ever. But there's hardly any science fiction in it. It's mainly people just coming up with new and inventive ways to adapt technology to be a little more convenient, considering that there's no power source other than animals and humans. But you've still got rail lines that are laid everywhere, for instance. You've got bicycles. You've got uh, hang gliders that you could make. You could make hang gliders. You, you're not, in other words, you're, you're reduced to a medieval technology, but not medieval technological awareness. And it's fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Now, I'm, I'm the first person to admit that most science fiction series go on too long. And this one does too. Absolutely. You, you all know, actually, from listening to this channel, that my, my main contention is that no science fiction or fantasy series should ever be more than a trilogy. If you can't get it done in a trilogy. But then again, what's the it, right? If the it is to tell a, a, a cohesive, you know, closed-off story... You don't need more than a trilogy to do that. If the it is to keep giving your fans what they want, Wheel of Time style, forever, well, <laughs> that's what that's what you get here. And with Safehold and with The Expanse and with uh, The Emberverse, I'm guilty. I'm absolutely guilty. I Once you read enough of these things, you're just eager for the next book. And... Sure, a back of the back of my mind, I'm saying, well, but shouldn't you wrap this up and bring it home? But most of me is saying, well, I just want to know what the characters are doing now. I want whatever you've thought up with next, that sort of thing. And that's what keeps science fiction series elongating just ghastly forever. <laughs> so, uh, so there you go. There's a, sort of an uh, uh, an additional list to Sean D. Stanfast. And you know, he put out the call to me. I feel like putting the call out to all of you. I would love to hear about series that I'm overlooking or that I, I left off my list, and I'd love to hear what's not on his list. I'd also love to hear your comments on both our lists if you read them. Uh, but anyway, I've, I've at last made a New World's November video, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up for now, and I will leave a link to Sean's video, uh, and I will see you soon. Thank you, BookTube.